I'm Dennis Longmire, who chairs this year's committee that oversees the College of Criminal Justice's Distinguished Lecture Series. My primary role this morning is to do some housekeeping before we formally get started with introductions and then our presentation. If you have not already done so, please silence or turn all of your electronic communication devices off. This is a federally certified courtroom and there are electronic devices so that if your cell phone beeps, you will be hit with a burst of water. So be careful. I'm going to ask also that you hold any questions that you have until after the session is over, unless Dr. Tyler overrides this request. I will be playing Phil Donahue with a microphone after it's over. So if you have a question, catch my eye and raise your hand and I will get to you as quickly as possible with the mic. And the reason for that is that we want to make certain that the substance of your questions are captured on the video and audio recording of this presentation so that future um, viewers will be able to understand what questions Dr. Tyler is going to be speaking to. I'd also like to remind all of the graduate students that immediately following the formal presentation, Dr. Tyler is going to join you in an informal colloquium in the Bates Room that will then be followed by lunch. I'm 99% sure that the lunch is going to be the buffet through C Java. There is a large group of people here, and so it might be, and we will, we will make this decision on the spot, it might be better for the lunch crew to go through the buffet and then take your plates back to the Bates Room so that we will eat, be able to eat there. Um, because it does look like the, the, the house is full, if you will. For those of you who are doing the lunch, make sure you sign the appropriate sign-in sheet so uh, Dean Webb will be able to pay for your lunches and um, we won't be charged with professional theft. I also want to remind everyone and or tell those of you who are here for the first time, the Beto Chair Lecture Series originated in 1981 when the university received an endowment from the Jesse H. Jones and the Mary Gibbs Jones Endowment Incorporation, which is also known as the Houston Endowment Fund. The purpose of the gift was specifically designed to enrich the educational experiences of the College of Criminal Justice doctoral students by bringing leading figures in our discipline to the campus. And it was named in honor of Dr. George J. Beto, who is the former director of the Texas Department of Corrections and was a distinguished professor of criminal justice at Sam Houston State University from 1972 until his retirement in 1992. With that said, I will now turn the podium over to um, our own distinguished colleague, Philip Jones. Dr. Jones will formally introduce Dr. Tyler. That's what happens when one attains senior professorship status. <laughs> uh, it's my great pleasure this morning to introduce this morning's BTO lecturer, Dr. Tom Tyler. Dr. Tyler received his PhD in social psychology in 1978 from the University of California at Los Angeles. Social psychology is sometimes jokingly referred to as the scientific study of things we already knew. Dr. Tyler's work can more, be more aptly described as the scientific study of things we should have known already but didn't. Over the course of the last few decades, Dr. Tyler's work has demonstrated again and again what should be an unsurprising finding, that the subjective experience of fairness and justice depends not only on what is done, but also on how it's done. Dr. Tyler and his colleagues have fleshed out the contours of this field of procedural justice such that we now know more about the procedures that cause people to feel as though they've been treated fairly and received justice. Moreover, his pioneering work has shown that these subjective experiences matter. They matter to people's perceptions of the legitimacy of our criminal justice institutions, and they matter to people's willingness to comply with the law voluntarily and to cooperate with authorities. Dr. Tyler is the leading expert in procedural justice worldwide. His procedural justice interests are pursued within his broader interests in the dynamics of authority in groups, organizations, and society. Dr. Tyler comes to us from Yale Law School, where he is professor of law and psychology. He has previously been on the faculty of Northwestern University, the University of California at Berkeley, and most recently, NYU. Some of his more familiar works include The Social Psychology of Procedural Justice, Social Justice in a Diverse Society, Cooperation in Groups, Trust in the Law, Why People Obey the Law, my personal favorite, and Why People Cooperate. 
I now present Dr. Tom Tyler, who will present today's BETO lecture, Legitimacy and Policing, the Benefits of Self-Regulation. Well, let me thank you for inviting me here. It's um, actually the first time I've ever been to this part of Texas, and it's really beautiful here, So, and it's also warm. <laughs> Two good things when you're coming from the chilly Northeast. Let me start out by raising a question that I think all of us can see as important, and then we'll try to talk about how we might answer this question. How should we evaluate the policies and practices of legal authorities, the police, the courts, corrections, any particular legal authority? I think this question can be addressed in a similar way in the case of all legal authorities, but I'm actually going to focus today on the police because in my experience, there's a transformation occurring in American policing that's based upon some of the ideas that I'll lay out for you today. And I think that's very exciting and I wanna talk about why I think it's happening. If we thought about how we have talked about evaluating the police, in the last several decades, I think there are three things that we might focus on. One is lawfulness. We all understand in the wake of the Warren Court, Terry stops, a whole series of discussions about police practices, that one way to decide whether something the police are doing is a good or bad idea is to ask whether it's consistent with the law. We've seen this rolled out in a whole series of discussions in recent years about police practices. For example, racial profiling. We ask, is it legal? Aggressive street stops in New York City. We ask, are they legal? And I thought it was very illustrative of this approach when it was revealed recently that the NYPD was infiltrating mosques to try to identify radical Muslims in New York City and they were criticized for doing this, the mayor's response very much fit this paradigm. He said, what we did was not against the law. So that's one framework to think about. Are the actions of legal authorities consistent with the law? A second approach is to ask if they're effective. When we think about many of the kinds of policies and practices that the police have engaged in, to try to fight violent crime, comp stat, hot spots policing, all sorts of different approaches. One obvious question that has been asked is whether they actually work. Do the actions of the police stop violent crime, for example? And in the parallel area that the police have carved out through 911 of being service deliverers, we ask about the effectiveness of that. What is the response time? how well is service delivered. So lawfulness, effectiveness, and then I think a third issue that's been very much in discussion, particularly about the police, but also about the courts is safety. We know that policing is a dangerous job and we ask how the policies and practices that we teach the police contribute to or undermine police safety. Certainly if you go to the FBI Academy, which trains a lot of local police. It's very striking that almost the entire curriculum is based upon the idea that you need to train the police about danger in the community, how to be prepared to protect yourself against danger, firearms training, so on and so forth. So safety is naturally a very important concern. What I think is striking about all three of these approaches is they all create a similar kind of dynamic in the relationship between the police and the community and the people the police are dealing with. And that's a negative dynamic. So if you're trained in lawfulness, then if you're a police officer, you're looking at the people you deal with in terms of suspicion. Are they the kind of people, are they doing the kind of things that would justify stopping them, searching them, arresting them? If you're interested in effectiveness, you're focused on people in terms of what's the appropriate kind of punishment, sanction, admonition to direct towards them. And as we know, when you're interested in safety, you have a very wary way of approaching the people you're dealing with, very much focused on 
where are their hands, and things of that type. All of these are perfectly reasonable from the framework of the goals of policing. However, they lead to what I would call a paradox regarding policing in America today. At least in terms of lawfulness and effectiveness, there's a widespread feeling that the police have improved tremendously in the last several decades, that there's a new professionalism in American policing. We know that acts such as shooting civilians are much lower in their rates now than they were 30 years ago. The police have transformed their ability to control crime. They've actually tried to anticipate and stop crime instead of reacting after it occurs to catch criminals. I'm not sure if we would say there have been improvements in the safety of police officers, but let's just say in general, in terms of performance, there's a lot that the police should be very proud of, and that is documented in a recent National Academy of Sciences report on policing. On the other hand, over this same period of time, public support for the police, the idea that the police are legitimate, as it's understood within the community, has not increased at a similar rate. And this is especially true in minority communities. Now, before I give you some data to support that, let me just say what I mean by legitimacy, because that's really a central concept in this discussion. Legitimacy is the view among the people in a community that the police are entitled to exercise authority, that they're entitled to make decisions, they're entitled to solve conflicts, to enforce rules, and that the people in the community have a responsibility to accept and defer to police authority. As that is measured empirically, there are three different ideas that researchers have studied. They're typically interrelated. Trust and confidence in the police, the view that the police are honest, that they're trying to do what's best for the community, the willingness to defer to police authority, so the feeling that if the police make a decision, you ought to follow it. If they enforce a rule, you should do what they tell you. And then viewing police actions as morally appropriate and reasonable. Often in the kind of public opinion polls that you've probably all seen in the newspaper. This is indexed as trust and confidence, and that's what I'm going to show you now. This is the percentage of Americans who express trust and confidence in the police over the last 30 years. And what's interesting is that it's basically a flat line. And that's striking to us when we think about what I said before, that in many ways the quality of the police, of police performance has increased, yet when we ask the public if they have trust and confidence in the police, you basically see it's been flat. And second, there is a large and consistent racial gap in confidence in the police. This is, depending on how you do this, it's 20, 25 percent. But what's really important from my perspective is it's not going away. So we don't see that these lines are converging. We see about a 20% difference in 2000 and a 20% difference today. We could stretch this back much further. We'd see the same thing, a persistent racial gap. So we see a flat line for the population in general, flat line for minorities and at a large gap. Now, from my point of view, this is important for several reasons. But particularly what I want to emphasize today is that this matters because when the police are viewed as legitimate, the research that's been done in the last several decades shows that several good things happen. And because the police are not viewed as more legitimate, these good things are not happening. One. When people view the police as legitimate, when they deal with the police, there's less likely to be resistance and hostility, escalation of conflict leading to injury of the person, the police, or both. 
increases in voluntary decision acceptance that are maintained over time. And I particularly want to emphasize the second of these two points. One of the difficulties with the police is the police are called to some situation and they tell people to do something. Turn off your stereo, you're bothering the neighbors. We find that in the presence of a police officer standing there with a gun, a taser, and a club, and mace, and so on and so forth, compliance is nearly universal. Although there may be resistance and conflict, the police can enforce what the orders that they give while they're there. But when they leave, people go back to their previous behavior because they didn't actually accept the right of the police to tell them to do this. And so the police have to keep coming, coming back over and over and over again to the same problems and the same situations. But if the police are viewed as more legitimate, people accept their directives and they continue to follow them once the officers are no longer there. That's a big benefit to the police, obviously. Similar issue with the courts. People follow court orders over time if they believe that the judges are legitimate. And third, legitimacy promotes widespread voluntary compliance with the law. So you have a large group of people in the community who are following the law on an everyday basis and are willingly cooperating with the police to report crime, to report criminals, to work in neighborhood watch. So these are all benefits that occur when the police are viewed as legitimate. And because the police are not gaining in legitimacy, we're not seeing increases in these kinds of behaviors. Now, as Phil said, I am a psychologist. And what they teach us in graduate school is that every problem needs a psychological analysis. So it's not surprising that I say that this should be the basis of research on the psychology of the public. But in this case, I'm going to convince you that it's actually right. We actually do need a psychological analysis of this topic. We need to ask, what shapes police legitimacy in the eyes of the public if it's not lawfulness and effectiveness, objective effectiveness? OK, so what, what is it that is the root of legitimacy? And then we need to evaluate police policy and practices through the eyes of the community. We need to ask what kind of policies and practices are viewed as legitimate and what kind are not viewed as legitimate. We had a really interesting discussion at breakfast, and one of the questions that came up is about community policing. And I would argue that I'm not really saying something different than what we've been saying in terms of community policing for a long time. Community policing is about trying to give greater attention and weight to the concerns of people in the community, trying to establish relationships with people in the community. And that's very much in the spirit of what I'm saying here. All right. So my argument is going to be, let's change the way we think about policing. Let's develop a new approach drawing on the psychology of legitimacy. And what I particularly want to try to address is what I think is the primary critique of this new approach, and that is that it won't work. And I want to convince you that it actually will work. All right, I'll be making two arguments. The first argument is that legitimacy matters, that people focus on the law and on the decisions of legal authorities in terms of whether they do or do not think that they're legitimate and that this is more central than fears about being punished. And second, that as we think about changing our conception of what we want from the public, moving more towards voluntary acceptance, willing acceptance, and cooperative behavior, legitimacy becomes even more important. And then the second argument, those of you who are familiar with my research won't be surprised to hear me make the second argument, 
that legitimacy is rooted in procedural justice. This, at this point in history, after a lot of social science research, is not an especially surprising or controversial statement for me to make, although at the time these ideas were first developed, they seemed very counterintuitive to many people. I will talk about research that supports this, but I'll just say for the moment, the key point is that people are primarily concerned about two issues when they evaluate authorities, legal authorities. Their decision making, if it's neutral, transparent, rule-based, and whether they respect people, respect their rights, treat them with courtesy. So quality of decision making and quality of treatment, two elements. And that that issue, whether the authorities are exercising their authority fairly, is the primary issue that people are concerned with when they react to dealing with a police officer, a judge, a corrections officer, any kind of a legal authority. Now, as I said, procedural justice, we can study it in two ways, but these are the two core concepts. We either ask how fair are decision-making procedures, how fairly were you treated, or we ask about the constituent elements of fair decision-making and fair treatment. However we do it, this is the key issue to people. Let me give you some evidence to support this. I'll start out with a study of the public. The approach is very simple in these kinds of studies. We interview people, we ask them about legitimacy, procedural justice, other features of legal authority, and then we look at their behavior, either by interviewing them and getting self-report, by getting the reports of others, or by looking at records. So first, what about the everyday behavior of people in relationship to the law? Recently, Jeff Fagan and I did a study, it's a random sample of the people living in New York City. We were concerned about compliance and cooperation, and we looked at the role of legitimacy and objective measures of performance in shaping that behavior. These are the results of our study. They're very typical of research in this area. So two points to be made. If you're simply interested in whether people comply with the law, this result shows what we typically find, that the primary factor is if they think it's legitimate and there are secondary influences of performance and the likelihood of being caught and punished. But as we move to this other aspect of people's behavior, cooperation, then we see a dramatic increase in the importance of legitimacy. If you want intelligence from the community, if you want people to call in and tell you if there are crimes going on or criminals in the community, if you want the public to come up to the community meetings to be part of the neighborhood watch, you're talking about cooperation, you need legitimacy to get cooperation. As I said, there are many studies now that show this, so I won't go through all of those. I'll just give a follow-up example from this study that I mentioned, because this is a panel study, and show you that even if you do complicated longitudinal statistics where you control on time one, look at time two, you get the two key findings that I think we're concerned about. One that legitimacy drives cooperation, and the other that I think is important is that there's no interaction with ethnicity. What that means is that everyone, whether they're white or minority, is shaping their behavior in reaction to the police by evaluating the legitimacy of the police. So there's not a different psychological dynamic for white and minority respondents. It's the same across all ethnic, or let's say the primary ethnic groups that we've been studying, Hispanics, African Americans, and whites. 
All right. Now, one concern, obviously, with what I talked about is that it's a study that uses self-reported cooperation. To try to make sure that this is not a problem, Larry Sherman and I did a study of people who had gone through either adjudication or restorative justice conferences after they'd been arrested for driving while drunk in Australia. Re restorative justice conferences are more procedurally just in the eyes of the people who go through them than adjudication, and therefore the people who go through restorative justice conferences come out of the system thinking the law is more legitimate. We start with that, and we look starting two years after the person had their case adjudicated. For the two years following, year three and four, we look at police records, whether the person is recidivated for this, this offense. And the results are supportive of the idea that legitimacy has a real impact. Those people who came out of their experience in court thinking that the law was not legitimate are five times more likely to recidivate in the future as recorded by police records than the people who came out of their, their experience thinking that the law was legitimate. So this is not just something that's going on inside people's heads. This is, has an actual reality out in the field in terms of their behavior. OK, so the first part of the argument is that we know that legitimacy shapes behavior, in particular voluntary behavior. The second part of the argument is that we can influence legitimacy through things that we can do. And again, I guess I would emphasize, we talked about this at breakfast that as the graduate students were asking about this. I would emphasize that to me, procedural justice is a means and legitimacy is the end. So what we want to show is that we have a means, a practical means to achieve this desirable end. All right. Can procedural justice drive legitimacy? This is that same New York City study that Jeff Fagan and I did. And the point here is to show that whether we think of legitimacy as obligation or as trust and confidence, the, the way that the police gain or lose legitimacy is through judgments about the fairness of the way that they exercise authority in the community. It's not by increasing the perceived risk that they can catch and punish rule breakers. It's not by increasing the perception that they are effective in controlling crime. It's by being fair in their treatment of people in the community. Recently, there, there's been some very, say it's exciting research to me because it confirms all my ideas. But let's say, I, to be more why it's in this talk, it's important because it's an independent research approach to these same questions. John Jackson, the study in England, He's looking at everyday law-related behavior, but in the same way, he's looking at the role of legitimacy in driving compliance with the law. He himself develops a more complicated vision of legitimacy where he's also concerned about the alignment of the, the perceived alignment of the police with the values of the community in addition to obligation. But the question is, do these values drive compliance. This is a national sample of the people of England and Wales, and it focuses on everyday compliance with the law. Now, this is a complicated causal model. I'll try to explain what I think are the main points. If any of you are interested, you can have the slide pack, and also there's a paper here if you want to dig into what, how he did this and what are all the kind of operationalizations. But the main point is offending behavior comes out of the perception that the law is legitimate, which is driven by the sense of obligation to obey the law. And moral alignment with the police also affects legitimacy and offending behavior. So two different ways of thinking about values, both are driving whether people comply with the law. And then the second thing that's really important is 
Why do you feel this obligation? Because you trust that the police use fair procedures. And interestingly, why do you think that the police share your moral values? Because the police use fair procedures. So both of these values are coming out of the way police are exercising their authority in the community and not particularly out of the, the judgment that the police are effective. Very consistent with the line of argument that I'm making. Jackson did a second study of young minority males focused on cooperation with the police. This sample became especially interesting after this study was done because this is really the group that was rioting in London. These are young minority males, the target group. Why would young minority males in England cooperate with the police? Same argument. They feel an obligation to the police. They feel moral alignment with the police. Why do they feel that way? Very strong effect of the police exercise their authority fairly, therefore I feel an obligation to obey them. They exercise their authority fairly, therefore I feel that they share my values, and for both those reasons I'm willing to cooperate with the police. So again, values leading to cooperation, procedural justice leading to values, and also, again, police effectiveness having very little to do with it. All right. So we can imagine a general model of legal authority where what we really want to do is we want to create legitimacy to motivate compliance, which is our traditional goal, but also to build this other range of goals, willing acceptance, willing deference, voluntary cooperation. So to build a broader set of connections between the police and the community. All right. Now this has all been abstract in the sense that these are people's views about the general nature of police behavior in their community. But one of the key issues for the police is deference in the immediate moment. Deference when they are dealing with a police officer on the street. And will the public accept and defer to the decisions that officer makes? So can a fair procedure facilitate that kind of legitimacy, which is crucial to police effectiveness? Here, I've looked at this in research I did with Yen Huo, where we looked at personal experiences that people had with the police and why they deferred. Now, I would emphasize that my focus here is on voluntary acceptance. It's not on compliance. It's on I willingly accepted the decision. I'm going to follow it. I'm not going to protest. I'm not going to try to undermine it. I'm not angry. OK, so it's acceptance. It's a large study of whatever experiences people had with the police in two communities in America that have troubled or had troubled relationships with the police, Oakland and Los Angeles. Actually, Oakland still does, although Los Angeles has gotten a lot better. So it's people talking about their recent experiences with the police. Right. People were interviewed about a variety of aspects of their experience. You can think about what you would ask people. Was their outcome favorable or unfavorable? Was it fair or unfair? And then the fairness of the way the police acted during this encounter. And two things that happened. I did or didn't comply, and I did or didn't accept what the police decided. And I'll focus first on acceptance. Here's what I think is the really key point. In personal contacts with the police, the fairness of the procedures that the police use is the overwhelming antecedent of deference to the police. To some extent, is the outcome favorable? Is the outcome fair? Enormously important is whether the police used fair procedures. And that's true for each of the different groups that were studied. So white are minority. People were concerned about whether they were getting fair procedures when they dealt with the police. 
Now, it's hard to look at those numbers and get any sense for if this is important. So what I've done here is I've divided the people up on two dimensions. One dimension is, did they get a good or bad outcome? So the police stopped me, they gave me a ticket, it's bad. Police stopped me, they didn't, that's good. And whether they did or didn't use fair procedures when they did whatever they did. One way that you could increase acceptance of what you do as a police officer is you can give people good outcomes. So people definitely are more willing to accept not getting a ticket than getting a ticket. About 10%. But you can increase satisfaction and acceptance about 70% by using a fair procedure. And if we look at this from the point of view of the law, the group we're really interested in is the bad outcome group. We can increase people's acceptance of negative outcomes about 70% by delivering those outcomes within a framework of procedural fairness. So think about that. 70% more likely to accept an unfavorable outcome because of the way the police officers acted during the stop. The other aspect of the same question is calls for assistance. Now, I think we all have a certain image of the police, that they are stopping people on the streets, stopping people in cars, giving them tickets. In reality, the primary way that members of the public deal with the police is they call the police for help. That does not mean that if you call the police for help, you're going to get a good outcome because the police may not be able to help you, or they may not be willing to help you. But the point is, you're calling them. And so the question there is, what leads people to be satisfied with what happens when they call the police for help. And what's interesting is that the results are very similar. Here the police solved the problem, got the person what they wanted. Here the police did not solve the problem. And again, they used a fair and unfair procedure. And the point is, again, that you can dramatically, tremendously increase the, willing, the satisfaction that people feel with the way you're dealing with the situation by using fair procedures. And if you're not solving people's problems, which sometimes is what the police end up having to do, you're still increasing satisfaction by about 60% by managing the call through fair procedures. So whether it's a question of Deference, when you're regulating, satisfaction, when you're providing service, it's about procedural justice. Now, I mentioned that in addition to acceptance, I ask people about compliance, and I think that that is a very important distinction to make. So let me show you the difference. Procedural justice is central to deference. I accept the decisions the police made. I'm not angry, I'm not resisting, I'm not undermining. I'm going to follow them, versus when the police were standing there in front of me with their guns and mace and clubs, I did what they told me to do. Compliance has very little to do with procedural justice. Acceptance has an enormous amount to do with procedural justice. So if we want the gains associated with deference, we need to think about procedural justice. The other thing that I think is important is the question of how people generalize from personal experience to general views about the legitimacy of the police. And here, I'm going to use this to, as an opportunity to address what I think is one of the primary concerns that typically comes up about this kind of research. The police feel that you can't be a police officer, you can't do what you have to do, give people tickets, if you're trying to exercise your authority through fair procedures. And I'll say that's not true. And I'll give an example of a study. It's a panel study. This is a study that Jeff Fagan and I did in New York where we interviewed people before and after they dealt with the police. All of these interactions have two characteristics. The person got a negative outcome and the person experienced procedural justice. So imagine that as you're driving home tonight, you get stopped by the police, you get a ticket, 
as the police officer is walking back to his car, you're holding the ticket in your hand, you're thinking, I really respect the police. That's what we would want. Okay, that would be the desired goal. And actually, that goal is being achieved. The police are delivering negative outcomes through fair procedures, and they're increasing perceived legitimacy and the willingness to cooperate with the police. So even though people are getting a negative regulatory outcome, they're still feeling better about the police afterwards because they're experiencing a fair procedure. Another study, this is a very interesting experiment that was just conducted in Australia. When you're in Australia and you're driving on the roads, the police have the right to stop you in roadblocks and have you take a breath test to see if you're driving while you're drunk. They experimentally assigned people to a regular condition and then says something about the Australian police. They had the, the regular condition is the not fair condition. And then they trained the officers in random circumstances to treat people fairly. So that's the positive condition, okay? So the question is, in a two to three minute stop, can the police do something that is sufficiently more fair than people have seen before that you can see a d difference in police legitimacy. The police were trained to do very simple things. They were trained to, first, they explain the, why they're doing it. Why are we stopping you? We, we have this policy because there's been a lot of death from drunken driving in your community. We hate to go to someone's home and tell them that someone has been injured or killed because of drunk driving. So we have this policy in place to try to lower the rate of drunk driving in the community. We are interested in your views about police policy. Here's a community newsletter, tells you what we're doing. Here's a letter from the superintendent, says we want your input. Tell us about your views about the police and police policy in your community. By the way, at the bottom, if you don't feel you were treated appropriately in this stop, if you have any complaints about the police, there's the superintendent's email address. There's his phone number, there's his tweet, there's his Twitter. Let him know, we wanna know about your experience. So they're enacting simple aspects of procedural fairness, they're asking for voice, they're explaining the neutrality of the policy, that this is a random stop, it's nothing about what you did. And then finally, the police are told to say something respectful to the person, to end the stop on a respectful tone, like, thank you for being cooperative. Thank you for wearing your seatbelt. Thanks for having a clean car. Something, think of something nice to say, something respectful to the person as they leave. Two or three minutes, simple procedure. This is the causal model that comes out of that. And the basic point is the condition that people are in, fair or not, leads to an overall judgment about the fairness of random breath tests, leads to a general sense of whether the police exercise their authority fairly, leads to heightened police legitimacy, heightened willingness to cooperate with the police, heightened satisfaction with the police. In other words, two or three minutes and there's a significant and discernible increase in the general legitimacy of the police and the willingness to work with them. So simple things that the police can do can raise legitimacy in the community. All right. So we can use fair procedures to get legitimacy and to get decision acceptance. All right, what is a fair procedure? I mentioned quality of decision making and quality of treatment. I would emphasize that in most studies like this one, in personal interaction that people have with the police, it's quality of treatment dominates their reactions. Quality of decision making matters, but it's less important. Another way to put this, if people feel they're being treated rudely or disrespectfully, discourteously, that overwhelms their reaction to the whole situation. They get very upset about that particular aspect of procedural justice to a striking degree. So this is typical. Interpersonal treatment is really crucial. All right, so 
I think we want to say, you think back to the beginning of this talk, that we have a better model for the exercise of authority. That model will build legitimacy, it will encourage compliance, it will encourage cooperation, and it's better than trying to project force and sanctions onto people. One of the benefits is that it's a strategy that we can enact even now. I give talks to different police groups and court administrators, and in the last three or four years, it's very typical that every time I go, before I get up on the stage to talk, the person who invited me says, remember, we have no money. No money. You can't suggest we do anything that costs any money because we don't have any money. So that, the good news is I don't. I'm not. I'm not suggesting you do anything that costs any money. I'm suggesting that this is a good thing to do because it doesn't cost money. There may be some money involved in training, like there's a lot of police training going on here. So you might change some of the things that officers are trained about, change correctional training. But it's not like I'm telling you to buy 5,000 expensive vests or fancy equipment. This is actually very doable. The other thing that I think is really important is the strategy is good for everyone. I think we get in a lot of trouble when we try to use a strategy that's targeted at one particular group in the community. And the nice part about procedural justice is all of the studies suggest that everyone wants procedural justice. And when people don't trust the police, no matter what, it's really about the fact that they don't feel that they get procedural justice. So it works well in situations of diversity and multiculturalism. The other aspect of this is whether we can extend the idea of procedural justice to agents of social control, in other words, the police. One of the big problems that we have in American policing is that the police are a quasi-military organization. We were talking about this at breakfast. One of the discouraging aftermaths of 911 is that the police have become much more like military organizations in the last decade. It's difficult to tell a police officer that he ought to listen to people in the community, that he ought to explain his decisions, that he ought to account for his actions, he ought to be respectful to the people he deals with. When that officer walks into the station house and doesn't get any of those things themselves. They don't get listened to, they don't get treated respectfully by their superiors. So any aspect of trying to change policing also has to address the culture of police organizations. And this is a study that speaks to that. It's also important because in discussions about policing in the 21st century, one of the points that the National Academy of Sciences report made is that to make strides in policing, we need to be able to give officers greater discretion to use their judgment in enforcing the law. But of course, we can't give officers discretion if we aren't confident that they're actually going to exercise that discretion within the framework of the rules and laws that they need to follow. So if we want officers to follow rules to the degree that they're exercising discretion, what do we need to do about the culture of the station house? This is a study of law enforcement officers about their attitudes, about the nature of their police organization, and then their rule-related behavior. It's just one example of a number of studies that have been done that have similar conclusions. Why will police officers accept rules, defer to rules? And does it have anything to do with the legitimacy of the organization's rules in their eyes, the legitimacy of their leaders, the legitimacy of the authority framework within which they work? It's the same problem. We want to show that officers are concerned about legitimacy and they're not just reacting to the costs and benefits that might be associated with following or not following rules. So just as people on the street 
are not reacting to whether they'll get caught and punished if they break the law. We have to show that officers are not reacting to the sense that they might lose a promotion or get a, a reprimand if they break the rules. So these are the results. They're very supportive of the argument that police officers are sensitive to legitimacy. You can see that first, compliance driven by legitimacy, and then as we move into acceptance, deference, and engagement in non-required behavior to help the organization, you see even a bigger legitimacy effect. So police officers are acting just like people on the street. They're reacting to legitimacy. Well, why would police officers think that their organization and its rules and policies are legitimate? The main reason that police officers do or don't think that their organization and its rules and policies are legitimate is whether they do or don't experience procedural justice when they're dealing with their sergeants, their lieutenants, their commanders. So essentially, police officers judge their authority structure exactly the same way that people on the street judge their authority structure. Are people with authority exercising that authority fairly? It's interesting in the case of the police, the particular concern that officers react to is their interpersonal treatment by their immediate superiors, sergeants, lieutenants, the people they deal with on an everyday basis has the most impact on them, and in particular, if those people treat them respectfully, care about their needs and concerns, show respect for them as people are courteous, Okay, and in that respect, of course, they're not any different than any of the people on the street. We just heard that they care about the quality of interpersonal treatment. Now, this is why I feel this is a particularly interesting question right now. Many police departments are trying to diversify, and they've recruited women and minorities, and they're fighting really hard to get those people to stay in their police organizations. Well, why would a minority officer stay in the department, be committed to the department. This is a study done in Baltimore County. Baltimore County is a typical police force. It's almost all white men, but they do have some women and some minorities. So the question is, why would those people stay in the department? Here's what's interesting. Why? Would minorities and women say that they are interested in staying in the department? Very much related to whether they think the department exercises procedural fairness in the way it makes decisions, the way it treats people. If you want to retain a diverse department, here's one way to do it. Same thing about commitment to the job, minorities and women, are more committed to the job when they think that the department has a climate of fairness. So we know also how to create fairness, I mean, how to create legitimacy within police departments. If we treat officers fairly, we create legitimacy, we build commitment to the job, we build intention to remain. Now here's what I think is a particular advantage of a procedural justice approach. We often read about the divisiveness that policies that favor one group over another can create within any organization, and particularly in police departments. This is an approach that doesn't require an effort to address the concerns of one group as opposed to another. Because even though it's absolutely true that if minorities and women feel that they're more fairly treated in police forces, that they're more likely to stay. It's also true that white males focus primarily on procedural justice when they decide if they're willing to stay. So in other words, you don't have to have a targeted strategy here. You could have a strategy of procedural fairness, which encourages the members of all the different groups in the department to want to stay, to be committed. Okay, so it's a strategy that doesn't divide people. It is a single strategy that addresses everyone's concerns. 
Then the final thing I'll talk briefly about is the post-911 environment. I believe that getting cooperation from minority communities is central to being able to identify potential terror threats. Obviously, in the case of the Muslim terror issue and 911, the Muslim American community is the community that's most relevant, although I would say this is a general point about fighting crime. Even organizations like RAND have recently emphasized that anti-terror efforts should be a policing issue, not a military issue, and that they require cultivating active cooperation from the minority community. Well, so I've been working with um, Aziz Hook and Stephen Schulhofer to study why it is that Muslim Americans and Muslims in London do cooperate with their governments to identify and report terror threats. There are several samples. I'll talk about first the sample in London. People are interviewed about their attitudes towards the government, society, and then about their willingness to cooperate. There are two concerns. Cooperative orientation, that means would you work with the police to help police your community? Would you come to neighborhood meetings to talk to the police about threats? And then in particular, willingness to report threats. So if someone in your building is building a bomb, would you call the police? If someone in your building spends their days on Al-Qaeda internet chat sites, would you call the police? In other words, will people report potentially threatening conditions to the authorities? Now this is another one of those complicated regression equations. Fortunately, this study is available if you want, so I'll just tell you what this says. First, what it says doesn't matter. There's absolutely nothing about the fact that the problem is terror or the fact that the target group is Muslims that is any different than any of the other research that I've talked to you about. Ideology, religion, has nothing to do with whether people say that they're willing to work with the police. Why do people work with the police? The police treat us fairly when they implement policies in our community. The police treat us fairly when they develop and formulate policies by giving the community voice, by talking to the community. So procedural justice drives cooperation just the same as in all the other research. And all of these other factors that are constantly brought up about terrorism as a distinct problem aren't important. As I said, this is part of a larger project. There's a parallel study in New York City, exactly the same results. Why do people in this minority community, Muslim Americans, cooperate with the police? They cooperate if the police treat them fairly. They don't cooperate if the police don't treat them fairly. It has nothing to do with ideology, nothing to do with degree of religious commitment or religious practices. So let me then just make one statement at the end about the broader implications of this research from my point of view. What I think is really changing in our society is the kind of behavior that we want. When I wrote Why People Obey the Law many years ago, I read the literature, the literature is really simple. The perfect citizen is a citizen who complies with the law, period. That's it, compliance. I think now we have a much more nuanced view we want public that voluntarily defers to the law, that accepts the authority of the police, their right to make decisions in the community, to their obligation to follow those decisions, their cooperation, in other words, active, willing cooperation with the police to police communities. And the same thing is from the police. We want the police to be able to use discretion, but we want them to use that discretion in an appropriate way way. This is, as I said, a widespread comment in lots of different areas about institutions in America, public policy, management, education. We want a more active connection between people and organizations. That means we really have to change 
the way we think about motivating behavior. We can't motivate behavior by trying to threaten people, by either threatening them with punishment or by punishing them. We have to focus on building values. And the point is we do that not because in some sense we have to do it, but because we get a lot of benefits from doing that. We get a better system of authority when people are deferring to decisions because they're deciding to accept them, when they're feeling obligated to follow rules, when they're cooperating. Now the problem is that an instrumental approach pulls us in the wrong direction. When people focus on punishment or the threat of punishment, it undermines other reasons for following the rules. It undermines the relationship between people and the authorities. As I mentioned at the very beginning, if the police are looking at people from this negative orientation of are you suspicious, should you be punished, are you a risk and danger, it undermines the quality of the relationship that people have with them. So we could think of it this way. We can have a model where we focus on values, we build up behavior that's shaped by values, people become more self-regulatory, we have fewer police, fewer prisons, we rely more on people. Now I know that saying fewer prisons may be a really bad idea here in Texas, but you could do something else. You know, you could do something else with your life. You wouldn't have to be a prison guard. So we could, those people could be doing other more productive things with their lives because we'd be relying more on the community to enforce rules, to cooperate with the police. Or we can focus on sanctions, undermine the role of values, increase sanctions as we're seeing now where you have to put more resources into surveillance, you have to have more severe punishments, more incarceration. And as we move in that direction, we increasingly feel pressure to be more and more punitive because we've undermined the alternative basis for authority, which is people's values. Right. So values are an advantage from my point of view because they lead to voluntary behavior. And I'll just conclude with three policy implications. I think we need to focus on value creation. There's very little research on children and adolescents building up legitimacy, but I think that's very important. Obviously, I've talked about the role of adult experience. My argument when I talk to police audiences is that you should think of every interaction you have with the public as basically a teaching moment where you're trying to teach the public why they should accept your authority and why they should support the police. Evaluating legal policies in terms of their implication on legitimacy. One of the things that communities are doing now that I'm very excited about is they are systematically introducing mechanisms to evaluate police-citizen interactions. They call up people who've dealt with the police and then they bring the results of those evaluations into CompStat meetings. It's a, a sort of truism of policing that the thing that gets measured is the thing that matters. If you go into a CompStat meeting and you want to evaluate your commanders because you're a professional police commander and you want to be empirical, the only thing you typically have is crime rate statistics. So of course you evaluate commanders by whether they've changed the crime rate. My argument would be if we can make available to commanders also legitimacy in the community, we can have a more balanced approach. Say, well, you lowered the crime rate, but look, people in the community say you're treating them really unfairly. And that gives us a basis for institutionalizing concerns about legitimacy in the evaluation of police commanders, in promotion, who becomes a higher officer, who gets the award for great performance. Okay, and then finally, just in general, I think we need to more systematically, more effectively monitor the climate of legitimacy. It's interesting that the government spends an, a large amount of money for its national victimization survey. 
to establish the rate of victimization of different kinds of crime, but it doesn't do anything to try to establish legitimacy. That is, what's the legitimacy of different police departments, of the exercise of policing authority in different communities, different states. We don't have any real systematic effort to evaluate this other important issue. And so again, we fall back upon crime rate statistics as if they were the only issue that mattered in the evaluations of the police and police authority. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that it doesn't matter if the police are able to manage crime. Obviously, we don't want high levels of crime, especially violent crime, of gun crime. I'm saying that we need a more balanced approach because in the long run, you can't arrest your way out of crime, is a term that people have been using lately. You can't really solve the problems that lead to violent crime, to gun crime, just by arresting people. If we can build up legitimacy, if we can build up good relationships with the community, cooperation with the community, in the long run, we are addressing questions of crime. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Based on the treatment and decision making and the level of interpersonal contact with the citizens, has there been any research on uh, procedural justice and civil liability? Like, are the police more likely to be sued by citizens the way they treat them? Is that does that come into the picture at all? I don't know of a study that specifically addresses that question, but I do know that there are a number of studies of police disciplinary procedures, like civilian complaint bureaus, and we always find that the primary reason that people complain about the police is discourtesy. Is it, it's always the fact that most of the complaints that get lodged are really, this person was rude to me, why did you treat me that way? So I think we could speculate that that would move into the question of suing the police as well. We certainly know in the area of doctors, where there's better research, that the primary reason that people sue their doctor is they think the doctor treated them unfairly, didn't listen to them, was disrespectful, dismissive and not the nature of the, the injury that they suffered or the nature of what the doctor did. So I think that's other, also evidence. I have a question regarding, um, you know, when you look at DUI studies, uh, particularly uh, time series analysis kind of things, a lot of times you see this bounce that happens when when a nation changes their law, they want to get tough on crime, the initial thing you see is that downward bounce and then that slow return back to the old norm as people become uh, uh, more familiar with how the law really is being enacted. And, and in many ways that fits in with the notion of uh, compliance versus cooperation. Um, so let's, let's just say initially that downward bounce has to do with uh, the, the instrumental side of trying to change yeah. society. Uh, in the United States, and I believe also in Australia, they've seen some pretty substantial reductions that have been long term in reducing DUIs. In, in this country in particular, it's about half what it was in the 1970s oh, great. as okay. far as fatalities go. Right. Uh, there's a side to me that wonders how much of that is uh, distributive justice versus uh, procedural justice. I was wondering if, if you were familiar with some of that kind of literature and if maybe you could talk a little bit about the role of procedural justice in creating long-term change that you would like to have in your society. Basically that drilling in to sure. the morals of society. Sure. Well, I think it's absolutely true what you said about the typical course of a reform. If you can have massive publicity, and this is like in Sweden where they've done some really nice controlled experiments, 
massive publicity about an attack on drunk drivers, that you're going to allocate more resources and so on, you can reduce the rate of um, that behavior for some period of time and then it tends to come back. And I think that illustrates the typical problem with a strategy of that type, that it's difficult to sustain the level of police presence, of stopping people, that you can make an instrumental strategy work. But I think it also, I should make an important point that you're, I think, implicitly making. It definitely is possible to make instrumental strategy works in the short term and if you're willing to devote enough resources. You know, and the problem is that in most democratic societies, for most of the things that we're trying to stop people from doing, we are not willing to do that. So then the question is long term, and I think that that's where, if you can change people's views about the police and views about the law through strategies like this, then you can get more long term buy in with people obeying laws because they think it's their responsibility and obligation to do that. So that's kind of the strategy that I think you have to use. It's interesting that I think there's a parallel right now with um, hot spots policing, where one of the approaches that the police are using now is to flood communities with officers. And if you flood a community with officers, then the crime rate definitely goes down as long as you keep the community flooded with officers. But the problem is that that never really is effective as a long-term strategy because you just can't leave. It's not like a military occupation. You can't just leave all those officers there. So when the officers are moved, then the crime comes back up. So it's exactly a parallel situation. What you need to be doing in that community is building more support for the police, more community cooperation. Then, in the long run, you will get higher levels of acceptance of the law and compliance with the law. So I think that would be what I understand to be the finding of the research, that you really have to build support with the community you know, in the long run. And I'd also just make one other point, which is we need to distinguish two groups that we're dealing with. We're dealing with the community, whether it's a middle class community or a high crime community, and we're dealing with hardcore career perps. Both of those groups are found to be affected by procedural justice. For example, there was a really interesting study done in Chicago where people coming out of prison, where they'd been in prison for violent gun crimes, have a very, very high rate of recidivism. So these people were assigned to a high procedural justice reentry procedure where instead of going in front of a district attorney and being threatened, if you break the law, we'll catch you, we'll throw you back in prison, they were treated fairly. They were, were brought into a table, they sat around a table with the district attorney and the district attorney said, look, we really want you to do well. We are really interested in trying to help you to live a better life. We want to hear about your ideas about how we can help to make sure you don't go back to prison. What can we do to help you? you know, we're, then, of course, they also said, but if you break the law, you're going back to prison. They saw a 40% reduction in the violent gun crime committed by the high fairness people as opposed to the control group. So even hardcore criminals are affected by being treated fairly. But even if they weren't, or to the degree that they're not, you are really aiming for the community. And the community is the group that's going to report on crime, report on criminals, be in neighborhood watch. So one reason to enact fairness in a community is that you get most of the people on your side. And those people help you to manage crime in that community. So there's sort of two different goals here. But I would argue that they're not in conflict and that these strategies actually work for both of those groups at the same time. Thanks for being here. It's a fascinating talk and a lot for us to read and think about. Um, my question is about potential exogenous factors that could influence perceptions of procedural justice and legitimacy. And I'm thinking about things maybe like media betrayals and things like that. Uh, and so in all of your dealings with police groups and so on, do you get a lot of defensiveness maybe or, or denial from agencies who say, you know, it's really not anything that we're doing. It's the way that we're written up in the papers. Right. Uh, and, and how would you address that maybe to an agency that has that concern and, and uh, maybe a willingness to be sure. more self-reflective? 
Sure. Well, I think the short answer is yes, absolutely. I think it's a widespread feeling among police departments that it's frustrating to try to create a more positive image because the media loves to present negative stories and if one bad thing will happen, then the media leaps all over it and undermines efforts. And, and I think we could probably say that in some extent and in some ways the police are absolutely right, that the media does have that attitude and is interested in presenting the police in a negative light, at least in some communities and some newspapers. But I think that the, the answer is still the same. That is, I've heard a lot of stories from police commanders about how when they've had trouble about some police action in the community, people from the community have come to the meetings and said, no, no, the police, you know, they're doing all these good things in the community, they're doing this. So you are building up social capital, and that social capital will definitely help you when you have a dark moment. Nonetheless, I, I do think that for any of you who are looking for a great dissertation topic, I think that we have not studied the role of the media enough and the degree to which media presentations undermine the experiences that people have in their own daily lives, dealing with the police, police in their community, and how do we balance one Rodney King video against police officers being in your community week in, week out, dealing with people, we have not really studied that set of issues, but I think it's really crucial. Yeah. Um, you've alluded this uh, throughout your whole talk of, about the uh, kind of sort of the idea of restorative justice, and I'm wondering if you could uh, talk, attest to the uh, linkages between procedural justice and restorative justice, particularly in terms of policy. Sure. Well, restorative justice conferences are experienced by the people that undergo them as more procedurally just than traditional adjudication. My general argument has been that restorative justice reflects the principles of procedural justice and that's one of the reasons that it um, is successful. I think it's not the only reason because restorative justice conferences, Braithwaite is a sociologist and he also has emphasized ties to the community, ties to your family, ties to your friends, and trying to bring those linkages to people into the restorative justice conference where, you know, your mother's standing there and you're saying, good kid, bad behavior. And so that's not really a procedural justice effect. That's more of an identification effect, an emotional connection effect, shared social bonds. But they're not in opposition in any way, and I think, in fact, that, well, actually in this study that Larry Sherman and I did, we found that if you look at adjudication versus restorative justice, that restorative justice produced its effects through higher procedural justice. But, but there was a feeling that we shouldn't mention that in the article <laughs> because it seem, seemed to be dismissive of an important area of sociology. Is that an answer? Okay. Other questions? I'd like to, if you can slide back to slide 76. Sure. Uh, I thought I saw something that I wanted to follow up on, but you moved too quick for me. You know, I should say also that along the lines of move too quick, all of this data that I presented is in papers, and I am, of course, happy to send people the papers are to give, I think you have the slide pack. So I'm not going through all this data quickly with the purpose of hiding the truth, but rather giving you a sense of what I think is the general picture. See, there are two significant um, outcomes that you don't highlight. Mm -hmm. One of them, terrorism, is moral with a negative significant, right. and then right. one of them is society discriminates against Muslims. Right. Speak to that a little bit. Tell sure. us what that means. Sure. Okay. Society discriminates against Muslims is not the police. It's just in general. So we tried to do something in terms of the general climate in the, the country. And that is, you could talk about that also as another kind of unfairness, unfairness against the Muslim community by the society. And then terrorism is moral, is really kind of the John Jackson idea that people also have a sense of what's morally right and wrong and that that affects them in addition to their views about the police. The reason that I don't really emphasize those things as much is because I don't have a, a statement about what the police can do. 
in response to those? I mean, we definitely could make the argument that society shouldn't discriminate. But these procedural justice elements are very powerful, and, and we know exactly how to address those, and that's why I emphasize those. Okay. Any other questions? If not, please join me in thanking. Thank all of you.